Put on your spectacles. It's time to read this issue of the Walla Walla Garden City Gazette. We'll be reading news articles from October 6th, 1894. In Bicycle Caps at Goldman's. Burke's Tri-Weekly is a new newspaper feature of Dayton, and it's newsy. Haverly's original Mastodon minstrels appeared Friday night at the Walla Walla Opry House. John Blyze and Miss Hattie Chapman of this county were licensed to wed in the auditor's office Monday. There are at present 48 prisoners taken in Audi in the county jail. 45 of these are in for dispensing 40-rod whiskey to the susceptible Native Americans. The Osterman brothers, builders of the Walla Walla Opera House, are excavating on the corner of Park and Birch. Upon these premises next week, they will begin the construction of a fine two-story house. This is a sightly location and will make one of the best residence properties in the city. Insane millionaire, in jail for selling liquor to the Indians. He thinks he owns the earth. In the county jail at the present time is a queer character by the name of J.W. Williams. He was brought from North Yakima a few days ago for selling liquor to the Indians. The man is apparently 50 years of age, of slight build and not bad looking, and is rather an easy speaker. He is imbued with the idea that he is possessed of immense wealth. A Gazette reporter was introduced to Williams by one of the men in charge of the jail. An interview was requested. In a very affable way, the reporter was asked into the cell of the millionaire, as he called himself. Yes, said Williams, as he seated himself on a cot in his cell, I am a millionaire. I and Johnny Boyle own four mountains of solid gold and a lot of placer mines in California. In the winter of 89, I shipped a train of 20 cars to North Yakima. Each car contained eight safes, and the safes were full of gold. I am the owner of 50 square miles of property in the heart of Philadelphia. I own a diamond hat that's hid somewhere in Montana. The penitentiary out here on the hill is mine. You may be surprised to know that I possess all land east of Seattle, and of course this includes Walla Walla County. Yes, I am a rich man, and when I die, you can have all my wealth. The reporter thanked the millionaire and bowed himself out. Mrs. Dr. Baker's New Barn In his ramblings about the city this week, the attention of a Gazette reporter was attracted by the sight of a new barn, just finished on the grounds of Mrs. Baker near the college. The building was designed by Mr. Guy Hamilton and is a model for convenience and capacity. The barn is 30 by 34 feet and 18 feet high at the eaves. On the ground floor on either side are five stalls for stock, the stalls for horses being on one side of the barn and those for cattle on the opposite side. They are provided with hay racks so constructed that the dust can filter through and escape from the feed. The mangers are supplied with both feed and water troughs. The water is conducted through pipes by a hydraulic ram from a spring brook nearby, and the supply is regulated by a faucet. Through the middle of the barn extends a passageway six feet wide. There is also a harness room on the first floor. In the attic are two large bins to which the feed is elevated by a pulley, and from which it is conducted to feed room on the first floor through pipes. From stable to attic, Mr. Hamilton had constructed for Mrs. Baker the most convenient and capacious barn that has been seen in this valley. Blood-stained hat. A Gazette reporter one day this week went to the courthouse on business with one of the county officials. In an absent-minded manner, the scribe opened the door of one of the storage rooms instead of the office of the official. The room was quite dark. 
Hanging on nail in a corner, an old, dusty, soft black hat could be discerned in the dim light. This piece of headgear had a very strange appearance, and thinking it might have a history, a closer investigation was made. Taking the hat from where it was hanging and bringing it to the light, it seemed to tell a queer story. It was perforated in eight different places, as if by bullets, and here and there were dark spots upon it resembling congealed blood. That the hat had been purchased in Walla Walla was shown by the mark, which read, Sam Lesser, Hatter, Walla Walla. Surely here was a relic with history. Upon investigation, it was learned that this battered and besmeared article had been worn by A.J. Hunt at the time he was lynched for shooting a soldier by the name of Emmett S. Miller, Private, 2nd Calvary, in Rose's Saloon on April 22, 1891. The lynching occurred on April 24th. The apparently unprovoked assault upon their comrades so incensed the soldiers that the death of the culprit was decided upon. Mutterings to this effect had been heard by a number of citizens and Sheriff M. McFarland, with two deputies, went on guard at the county jail, where the prisoner was placed awaiting trial. About nine o'clock that night, about 40 soldiers left the garrison by some roundabout way. They were well armed with revolvers and carbines and were under the strictest discipline. Upon their arrival at the courthouse, a detail of soldiers were placed around the square, guarding all approaches. The balance of the soldiers marched to the jail entrance. They commenced pounding on the door and demanding entrance. What do you want? asked the sheriff. We want that man Hunt, was the reply. I won't give him up, was the response from the sheriff. Very well then, we will blow up the jail with dynamite. Looking out of the window, the sheriff could discern the forms of the soldiers as they stood ready to obey orders. The ominous click of many guns gave a warning that the watchers were obliged to heed. Thinking to work a ruse to warn the citizens and secure aid, the sheriff said he would open the door. When this was done, the soldiers crowded into the entrance and covered the guards with their guns. Taking the keys from the jailer, they opened the cell door. They took him out to the open air and their guns spoke. The sound alarmed the people, but when they reached the scene of the tragedy, no trace of the assailants could be found. Their plans had been well laid. Someone picked up the hat of the dead man. It was produced in evidence and afterward hung in an out of the way place, possibly not disturbed till examined by the Gazette reporter. The psychological drama of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was played at the Walla Walla Opera House Monday evening. Richard French, who plays the dual role, is a powerful actor, and in him the interest of the play really center. His transformations from the good Dr. Jekyll to the murderous wretch Mr. Hyde are startling in the extreme. Miss Jessie Sewer, as Sybil, the victor's daughter, who is in love with Dr. Jekyll, is a fine actress and maintained her part well. The other members of the cast acted satisfactorily. Another horse stolen. A man named Wilson, proprietor of a livery stable in Prescott, had a horse stolen from him last Friday night. The two men came at him and said they wanted a horse and cart to take them to Waitsburg and back again. When they got about three miles out of Prescott, they turned their nose of their steed in the direction of Walla Walla. Nearing an old deserted cabin, they drove back of it, unharnessed the animal, and left the cart. A saddle was procured somewhere, and the horse and rider lost track of. It is not known what became of the other man. Mr. Wilson was in town Saturday looking for his lost property, but no trace of them can be found. New gowns for fall. The gown on the left is of drab crepon, the flouncing of cape being of cream crepier. 
The others of gray crepon, wide skirt with two ruffles. The waist is sheared back in front into a yoke and again at the belt. The child a sailor's frock is of plain flannel trimmed with silk and the other was made of parmetta cloth trimmed with satosh. Heads are cut off. City Council decapitates Marshall Haley's appointees. Be it resolved by the Mayor and Common Council of the City of Walla Walla that the police force of the City of Walla Walla shall consist of the Marshal and three regular policemen. Also that the Poundmaster be invested with police power, but this power shall in no wise interfere with his duties as Poundmaster. Suit for Damages At this point, the clerk read the statement of Miss Caroline Evers, a widow with two minor children, to the effect that July 13th last, as she was passing over the sidewalk near the corner of Chase Avenue and Willow Street, a loose board gave way, causing the complainant to stumble and fall. Injuries resulted to the right knee and dislocation of one wrist, the same preventing Mrs. Evers from performing any manual labor for which she ordinarily supports herself and children for a period of eight weeks. The petitioner asked the city for $16 to reimburse the injured party for drug and doctor bills and $25 indemnity for loss of time. As damages for the permanent injury to the wrist, Miss Evers is asking $500. Mr. Blandlord took the floor and ventured the opinion that if a committee were appointed to confer with the lady, the matter could probably be compromised.